obviously we need prayer. The, uh, we have problems we can't solve, it seems like, and challenges that only God can help us with. Drug issues, immigration, all of these things that seem to be on the landscape and uh, seem to be struggling with. But we need that. And there's more violence in America than uh, I think that, that I've ever seen before. I mean, I notice it here in Greenville. The news blurps that I get from the TV station, every day somebody shot somebody. This morning I, was, I just noticed the headlines, 12-year-old boy in Asheville was killed and another teenager was shot at 2 or 3 a.m. My mom always said, and dad, there's nothing good ever happens after midnight. And of course, my curfew was not even midnight, it was 11 o'clock. And uh, Betty's was worse than that, it was 10 o'clock. Because her grandmother didn't like me, that's why it was like that. <laughs> and every time we had a date, she, her grandmother had a heart attack. I never seen a woman have that many heart attacks and live to be almost 90. I said, Lord, have mercy. But anyway, we laugh about it now, but it wasn't funny then. But we need to pray for America. And the drug problem, I was reading the other day that with the uh, uh, painkillers, there are drugs that could be prescribed, but the insurance won't cover them. And therefore, they go back to the ones that are forming uh, uh, addictions. And uh, I didn't realize that I, didn't, I can only take one because of some of my stuff that I have to take, but, and that's Tylenol. And I didn't know, I don't think you can get addicted to Tylenol, but this is what I learned. You can become dependent upon it. And I believe God wants us to depend on him, don't you? And not on anything in the bottle, nothing. Depend on the Lord. That's the best place. And so you have a few symptoms when you stop it if you're doing it regularly because even though it's not addictive, you can have a dependency there. And uh, not just the illegal drugs, but the medical prescriptions that are floating around and the abuse of it. It's a problem in America. And God help us. Our prisons are crowded, can't <clears throat> find places for people, and the violence continues. We need an old-fashioned revival, a turning to the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we do love you this morning. And <clears throat> in order for things to happen as they should, the church must be what it should. In America, we need revival. The church needs to be revived, and we need to get outside the four walls and begin to influence our culture and our communities rather than being shaped by the culture. We need to shape culture. And I pray that you would help us today, Lord, to go to our knees in prayer and believe you for a turnaround in this country from the White House to the to the uh, small dwellings in our nation, every place in between, that people would come to know Christ in a personal and a real way. And if they know him, that their, their hearts would be quickened and revival would take place in America again. Turn us around, we pray, before it's too late. We pray for our president, pray for our governor, Pray for our mayor. We pray for all of those who serve in government today that you would guide them. I pray for wisdom, Lord, wisdom from above that is available to them. And I pray they would find that wisdom and make right choices. <clears throat> this morning, we love you and we thank you for your word. And as we look in it today, we ask you to anoint us Bless us and touch us by your mighty power. We pray in Jesus' name. And Lord, we'll give you praise and honor for everything that is done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
I want to ask you to put Naomi Lister on your list of prayer. She is not doing well, and uh, I, I won't go into any further detail, but she really needs a touch from God. This morning, I want you to turn with me to a book in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles, chapter 15, 2 Chronicles. I want to I want to preach uh, a a message today entitled, Never Underestimate Prayer. In fact, I felt God speaking to my heart to say to you today, do not underestimate the power of your prayers. Do not begin to doubt God. God is still on the throne. My pastor used to say every week, God is still on the throne. Prayer still changes things because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm glad to report to you, he hasn't abdicated. He hasn't stepped down. He is still ruling and reigning today. And I would like to read verses 1 through 7 And then just a few moments, I'll come back to my text out of those verses, and we'll get started. The Bible says, 2 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Azariah, the son of Odeb. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you. While you are with him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their distress they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, he was found by them. In those times, There was no peace to him who went out or to him who came in. For great disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. They were broken in pieces. That's pretty descriptive, isn't it? Nations was crushed by nation, city by city. For God troubled them with every sort of distress. But you... Take courage. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. May God bless the reading of his word. And again, I want to repeat, never underestimate the power of your prayer. For your own personal needs, God is able and willing to meet your needs. For the needs of our church, which are many, God is able to meet every single need. And I see it weekly here. We have a need, and God meets that need. He's never late. He's never early. He's always on time. And he always supplies. Our city needs prayer. Thank God for the revitalization downtown. Everywhere I go, I ask people, have you been downtown Greenville? And I have, I've had people tell me, our city has studied your city, and that's a model for their revitalization. And I thank God for that. But sin always mars man's creation unless there is a revitalization spiritually. And prayer is, as ma- is a major emphasis in First and Second Chronicles, especially Second Chronicles 14, 15, and 16. Ten times I've counted the words seeking or sought the Lord in those verses, in those chapters. Ten times. And we should make it a major emphasis in our life as well. Prayer is exceedingly important. What does it mean to seek the Lord? Well, I'm told, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I'm told the Hebrew word literally means to trample underfoot. The picture is 
a path that's well worn because it is frequented. That is if frequented so often that you wear a path there. I was thinking a few months ago we had our carpet replaced in our dining room. And uh, I learned something about carpet after they put in the wrong carpet first and had to come back and take it up. And, and that was upstairs and in a room upstairs. It was a royal mess. But uh, I learned the padding is important. And this is very plush, feel, feels very plush because of the padding. But I have two putters in the dining room. You say, why do you have them in the dining room? Because we don't use it much. And uh, everyone, I have three golf balls laying there, and every once in a while I'll stop and I practice my putting. I'll hit it with one putter to the next wall, and then I have another putter over there. I hit it back to that wall. But I, you know what I've noticed? That everywhere that ball rolls on that carpet, there is an there is a evident path where it's gone. And I suppose if I were to do that long enough, I would wear a path out in that carpet. I don't plan to do that because I'm afraid of Betty. She would really get on me then. But we should be going to the place of prayer so frequently that a path is worn. And I'm not just talking about the physical place in your house, but I'm talking about in your heart. That when God looks down on our hearts, He sees a well-worn path to the altar to seek after him and to call upon him. uh, The verb has the nuances of seeking with care and of inquiring after knowledge and insight or advice on a problem. So the idea is carefully to pursue the Lord as the source of all wisdom and holiness. And that's a good definition of seeking. It is not just occasional, but it is persistent and consistent. My text this morning is found in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15, where the Spirit of the Lord came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, Odad, And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you are with him. And if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. And that's my my theme, that's my text. This is God's special message, not just to the king but to the people of Judah and Benjamin. The the land of Israel now is divided. Israel, ten tribes, two tribes basically with with, uh, Judah. It contains both a promise and a warning. And I want to just talk to you about those. A promise and a warning. You see, my question is, why did God say this to Asa? Because if you go back to chapter 14, verses 4 through 7, you will find that Asa had already committed himself to seeking the Lord. In that fourth verse, it says he commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to keep the law and the commandments. He also took out of all the cities of Judah the high places, the incense altars, and the kingdom had rest under him. He built fortified cities in Judah, for the land had rest. He had no war in those years, for the Lord gave him peace. And he said to Judah, Let us build these cities and surround them with walls and and towers, gates and bars. The land is still ours, because we have sought the Lord Our God, we have sought him, he said, and he has given us peace on every side. So they built and prospered. And so if here he's already commanded his people 
And he's let them know we are blessed because of God. Can America be made great again without returning to God? The answer is very dubious. It's, very, it's not very clear. I know we can make progress, but can we be great without God? We need God in America. And he commanded Judah then to seek the Lord. He took the, the, began to re, revitalize his country, took out the incense altars and high places out of Judah. The kingdom had rest under him. He built up their defenses. He had no war in those years. But if you read on in that chapter, the Ethiopians attacked Asa. And when they did, here's what he did. He cried out to the Lord. Now Asa sought God when the enemy came against him. Read on in that and you'll find that he had 580,000 mighty men of valor in his army. They probably could have defeated the enemy. But he chose not to rely on his own ability but to rely on the Lord, not the flesh, but the Lord. We live in a day where there are different techniques for everything in the church. But the, the truth of the matter is, without the power of God, there will not be a church built that brings honor to the Lord. And we must rely upon the Lord and not our own abilities our own talents, and our own efforts. He chose to seek the Lord. And he, he explains that in verse 11 and 12, why he did this. He says, uh, he began to, his prayer, this is a great prayer. As he began to call out to God, Asa cried to the Lord, his God, O Lord, there's none like you to help between the mighty and the weak. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you, and in your name we have come against this multitude, O Lord. You are our God. Let, our, let not man prevail against you. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Asa and the people who were with him pursued them, and they were broken, it says, before the Lord, the, the enemy was, and his army, the men of Judah, who carried out God's plan. They carried away much spoil, and they attacked all the cities, and not a single one of those that came against them survived. God gave great victory. I'll tell you, God is better at fighting our battles than we are. And if you and I decide we're going to fight them, God will let us. But he'll back off and let you take the licks as well. But if you put God's honor on the, on the table, he reminds me of David when he came against Goliath. David said to Goliath, you come against me with sword and shield but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, our God. In that name that God has given to us to use freely. We come in your name, he said. You are our God. Let not man prevail against you. He knew what it was to seek the Lord and to enjoy God's provision. Why did God then warn him? For every promise, you know there's a condition. And God's promises are conditional. The Lord is with you while you are with him. This reminds me of James 4, 8. Draw nigh to God. He will draw near to you. What happens if you don't draw near to God? There will be a distance between you and God. But if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. And I've found that it's not 50-50. 
if you take one step towards God, if you make up your mind to seek the Lord, God will meet you. You will walk alone. He will walk with you and he will meet your needs as you make that determination in your heart to seek after God and to rely upon him. He says if you seek him, he will be found. God will allow you to discover him. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. Listen to what the scripture says, Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Can you say amen? He hears our prayers this morning. Because if we're living right and walking with God, you say, well, why isn't he answered? You'll have to take that up with him. But I'm promising you, God will not be embarrassed when you face him on judgment day. You will not be able to say, I prayed, you didn't answer. God will always keep his word. Heaven and earth may pass away, but God's word will not pass away. God closely attends to the prayers of God loyal people. That's in the message. He closely attends. I said, I've said it this way. He waits on his regular customers first. If you're a regular at the throne of God, if you pray daily, you're seeking God, and you're crying out to God, Lord, I need you. Help me, Lord, I can't do this in my own strength. God will meet you every single time. He's promised it. You can trust him with it. You see, your prayers can make a difference to what happens. God will discipline those who turn from him. Distress and even sickness can be part of his discipline. You say, well, I don't know about that. You know, the scripture that I have, that always perplexed me, because I like everything to be just so black and white, just cut and dry, it either is or it isn't, but where God said, if you heed my word, I believe it's Exodus 15, I will put none of these diseases upon you that I have put upon the Egyptians. And so God disciplines us. If you and I don't hear his still small voice, he knows how to thunder his voice to us. And we need to be careful that we have an ear that listens to the voice of God. Your prayers make a difference. I like this statement. I'm not sure who made it. But it says prayer is the prelude to peace. The prologue to prayer, to power. The preface to purpose. And the pathway to perfection. When we were singing this morning, and I think someone made the, the statement, maybe in the, the, the words that were spoken, because Christ, and this Christ died, we have access to the Father. And you know, they tell me that curtain was so thick that separated the Holy of Holies from the outer courts that it was impossible for a man to, to rip it, but not for God. God reached down by his mighty hands, ripped open that curtain as if to say, come on in, children. You have access to the Father. You can come into the throne room of God, make your petitions known, and God will answer prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I love to say a good word for the Lord, don't you? But sometimes you get weary in your praying. I do. Sometimes it gets, it gets to be routine. When, you're, when your devotional time becomes routine, it's time to change. It's time to do something different and keep it fresh so that we don't get in a rut. Your prayers make a huge difference in what happens. And... We, we want to, to be in touch with God. 
And so the scripture where it says, if you seek me, you will find me. But if you forsake me, I will forsake you. King Asa makes this point so clearly. This is probably the strongest thing in these 14, 15, and 16 chapters. He was a man who started well. He did well, and we've read about it. When the Ethiopians came down trusting God, peace came, prosperity came, and there was a cleansing of the land. But his spiritual reforms brought revival to the southern kingdom. And there's one of the verses in that 15th chapter says that the people in other tribes who were not considered part of his kingdom because they realized the Lord was with him, they began to move and to, they wanted to live where he was. And I thought, what a novel idea. When the city takes note, the Lord is with us. And they want to be with those who the Lord is with. You didn't hear what I said, did you? It's not our program. It's our God. And I thought, what an attraction when our life is what it should be. It draws others to Christ. They want to know, what is it in your life that makes a difference? What, have you, what are you on? What are you taking to be happy even in the midst of difficulty? You see, God blessed him. But later, he forsook the Lord and incurred his discipline. The fire died out. The story is told of a pastor's wife who attended a conference. Her desire was to find a way where she could have spiritual victory all the time and not be this up and down stuff. And she was listening to a retired missionary, a spiritual veteran who was nearly 80 years old. What she heard was not an easy answer. Rather, it was profound principles stated as a metaphor, which influenced her life from that point forward. She heard the old man quietly say, untended fires soon die and become just a pile of ashes. Untended fires soon die and become just a pile of ashes. Though it was blazing yesterday, neglected today, and it begins to wane, he forsook the Lord. You read about it in the 16th chapter. The king of Israel attacked Asa and Judah. Instead of turning to the Lord as he did in, when the Ethiopians came, he turned rather to Ben-Hadab, the king of Syria, and sent him gold and money to be his partner so that Israel would turn away from their attack. And again, God's prophet came on the scene in chapter 16. And verse number 7, the prophet spoke again, Hanai, the seer, came to Asa king of Judah and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Syria, did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped you. In other words, had you taught, sought my face, because apparently Syria was in cahoots with Israel before this. You would have defeated this army and the victory would have been much greater than what you experienced. You can do things in your own strength. You can bring your Ishmaels to God and say, Oh, that Ishmael may be accepted with you, the work of my flesh, but no flesh will glory in his sight. It's that which the Spirit of God does through us that God will honor and reward. He's not looking for superheroes. He's looking for those who have a relationship with him. God said to him through this prophet, 
were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans, a huge army and very many chariots and horsemen. Yet because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Notice he didn't say perfect. Blameless, very different. But those who are seeking him, those who have a heart for God, those who are going after God, God watches over them. And wants to show himself strong in their behalf. And he said, you have done foolishly in this. From now on, you will have wars. And Asa was angry with the prophet. Put him in the stocks, in prison. He was in a rage because of this, of this, uh, of this man's message. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at the same time. And then he goes on down in the 12th verse and says Asa was diseased in his feet and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease he did not seek the Lord but sought help from physicians. Now I don't believe God is against doctors, do you? I hope not. But I'll tell you what he is against. Trusting in them and not in him. And even though we seek the best help we can get, our hope is in the Lord. Amen? Our faith is in God. And we pray for them. And we thank God for the great works that they do. But we know, and I've had doctors tell me, no doctor can heal anybody. Somebody else does the healing. And it's important that our faith is in God. And we haven't trusted in our medicine or trusted in our doctor. He sought help from others rather than God is the focus of this business. And this is a a pitiful end to a man's life. That he let the fire go out. He forsook the Lord and sought help from others. That's a central lesson of his life. Summed up by the prophet Isaiah, Azariah. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. The godly George Muller used to pray as he grew older. Lord, don't let me become a wicked old man. When I first heard this prayer, the writer said, I thought, come on, George, there's not a chance of that happening. Mueller walked with God for many years in a humble, prayerful manner, as few others ever have. But he knew that even after all those years, His fire with God would soon die out and become just a pile of ashes if left untended. The question that I want to leave with you today is this. Are you tending the inner fire? Untended fires soon die out and become just a pile of ashes. Even if you've been a Christian for many years, are you still actively, persistently seeking the Lord? The lesson of Asa is, if we seek him, he will strongly support us. If we forsake him, we will come under his discipline. It seems strange to me that if you read the the last verses of chapter 16, that in the honor of this king... They built a huge fire. And I said, how sad. The fire of others who honored him blazing brightly while the fire of God simmers to just glowing coals. It's a sad thing, but it doesn't have to happen. 
The thing that we have to realize, there is no magic place in the Christian life where you attain to a place with God that you could just coast the rest of the way in. God has constructed Christianity and our faith and walk with him so that we have to continually depend upon him. Don't let your hands grow weak. Don't have feeble knees, as the author of Hebrews said. But have strong knees. If you can't bow, you can bow your heart. You can lay before the Lord. You can call out to God. You can seek his face. Seek his presence. God will honor that. We, we need not involve ourselves in anything that God gives us to do without expecting strong support from the Lord. But it's not automatic. We keep the fire burning. That's my message today. You say it's a strange message. No, it isn't. As we sort of initiate celebration of our independence, America needs God. America needs God. The church needs God. And there's only one way to get to him. And that's to go to our knees. Did you know education normally makes a person less spiritual? God's ministers aren't made in the classroom. They're made in the prayer room. Where people have bowed before him. Church, I believe God has laid it on my heart. The Bible says we're to be known as a house of prayer. And we need to get about the business that God has given us. Ezekiel 22, 30. God sought throughout the land for someone to stand in the gap and make up the hedge that he wouldn't have to destroy his people. And he found none. God's looking today for intercessors. Not for those who brag about it, and those who talk about being gifted, I don't believe intercession is a gift. I believe it's a spirit of God. And every believer can have the spirit of intercession. And my prayer today for our church, for the church in Greenville, is that a spirit of intercession would come upon us. We would go to our knees in prayer. Oh, God. Help us. We're no match for the enemy in our own strength. We need your strong support. We need you to come and minister to us and help us to keep the fire burning. Not just be sitting around waiting for Jesus to come. Making a difference while we wait. If you can't do a lot, you can pray. That's a lot. Prayer is the first thing. It's not the only thing, but it's the first thing. You can do more than pray after you've prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Prayer is number one. Seek the Lord. I'm so glad that this was ingrained in me, not in Bible college, but in the church I attended while I was in Bible college, that prayer is the key, that you seek the Lord and you put the word of God into practice. My pastor that I consider my pastor because I sat under his ministry longer than any other pastor in my life is now at least 88. I read his devotional today. He has a website. And every day is a fresh devotional. 
because it's so refreshing to hear somebody just give you a, the thought and give some scripture to back it up and talking about we're in the world, we're not of it. And we can't become like it or we'll make no difference in it. And the Lord himself prayed, Father, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but I pray you keep them from the evil, the evil one. That's God's prayer for us this morning. That's God's prayer. I pray. When you read this, they made a covenant with God to seek him. And I wished I, if I had uh, my scriptures here, I would read it from the New Living Translation because it said they shouted out their commitment to God. They got a little boisterous about it. We will seek the Lord. That's where it starts. You choose it. You choose it. I will seek God. I won't stand behind the pulpit without prayer first. I won't stand in my class without having prayed through about this lesson. I won't, do, I won't be a greeter or an usher until I've prayed first. I'm making that choice and that covenant with God. I will seek your face. I said to the Wednesday night folks a couple of weeks ago, in 1967, Betty and I, along with two small kids, moved to Lakeland, Florida to prepare for what I'm doing here today. The first Sunday in the church, First Assembly of God, Lakeland, Florida, Arthur Graves spoke. He was well in his up into 80s. His voice was monotone. He was very weak, you could tell it. But his text was, which I've never forgotten, that's been over 41 years ago, more than that, maybe 51. It'd be 50, over 50 years ago. He said these words. The psalmist wrote, when you said unto me, when thou saidest unto me, the King James says, seek my face. My heart said to you, O Lord, thy face I will seek. That message has stood with me all these years. I don't remember everything about it, but I remember some of it. But that scripture fastened itself upon my heart. And this morning, the greatest contribution that I could ever make to your life would be somehow to God, for God to use me to get you to the point you go to your knees in prayer. You join the army of intercessors. Begin to call on God. We're not bombarding heaven. We're bombarding the gates of hell. God's gates are open. Through the blood and through the name of Jesus, we have access into his presence. This morning, would you just take a few moments here to reflect on that? What will you do with this message? Is this just another one that you've heard and you'll go out and say, man, that's great, isn't it? I take those with a grain of salt because I know nothing great without God, but God's word is great. Or will you say, Lord, when you said to me this morning, seek my face, my heart is responding, your face, O oh Lord, I will seek. Will you make that commitment? Will you say, yes, Lord? Yes, Lord, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you.